So I get ready to go. Yep, it's it's like counting down. <laughs> okay, so I just my forty five minutes start from when I start, right? Yep. Okay, Gordon, hold on. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Snakes Are Everything. I'm Melissa Amarillo, I'm the Executive Director, and along with Jeff Smith, co-founder of Advocates for Snake Preservation. For those unfamiliar with ASP, I just wanted to tell you a couple things about us. Um, ASP is a 501c3 charity dedicated to changing how people view and treat snakes. We do this through storytelling about wild snake behavior to counter prevailing myths and also to make snakes more familiar just with telling stories about what they're really like. We also provide solutions for human snake conflicts that sometimes end badly for people but often prove fatal for snakes. And all of this work is made possible through donations, both big and small. So today I'm super excited to introduce our guest, Gordon Berghart. He is the Alumni Distinguished Service Professor in the Departments of Psychology and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Tennessee. He also sits on the ASP Board of Directors. We're pretty proud of that. Um, and honestly, Gordon has been thinking about and studying and writing about snakes and other reptile um, behavior and how they think what they're capable of for so long, it would take the full hour for me to go over everything. So I'm not going to try to give a complete bio, um, but I do want to just say a couple highlights kind of related to this and sort of like how we first um, at ASP became aware of Gordon and his work. Um, Gordon participated in the first symposium on reptile social behavior in 1976 and co-organized the second one, which was exactly 40 years later in 2016. Um, and that was one of the first places that we presented our research on Arizona black rattlesnake social behavior, which was pretty cool. And maybe the first time we met and talked in person, Gordon, I think it, it might've been, um, but, and, and this is kind of funny. Um, if you, if any of you also watched our snakes or everything with, with Harry, this is a similar story. My very first herp meeting, um, was the 1998 International Herpetological Symposium. And one of the first talks on the first morning um, was by Gordon. And the title was The Private Lives of Snakes. Can they be studied? Does it matter? Should we care? So that is pretty funny that that was certainly the first time I had ever heard or seen you because I had never been to a science meeting before and was kind of just getting back into reptiles. And that was also the first time I heard about Harry um, and learned about rattlesnake parental care, which is basically like why I'm here. So um, yeah, so this is this is pretty, pretty exciting, a funny little connection. Um, and so I'm just about ready to hand it off to you, Gordon. But before I do, I just wanna remind everybody that we are gonna do questions. We'll do them at the end, but just feel free to put any questions or comments um, in the live chat in YouTube um, as we go along. If there's something that needs to be answered right then about a particular slide, um, I'll stop Gordon, but otherwise we'll just wait till the end because that seems to work a little better with presentations like this. Um, so yeah, take it away, Gordon. Oh. 
Okay, I assume everybody can see the uh, screen. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, a wonderful introduction. And uh, I'm really uh, happy to uh, be here and talk about my favorite animals, snakes, that I've been uh, studying for a, a long, long time. Uh, so I want to start by just uh, mentioning all the institutions and uh, and generically, all the students and colleagues that I've worked with over the years, none of this work really been done uh, or accomplished uh, without the help of so many people who uh, love animals, love animal behavior, and uh, particularly reptiles. Uh, now, reptiles and snakes uh, in particular have a strong cultural influence in our lives uh, throughout human history. And, uh, people have had ambivalent feelings about them for a long time. A very early book up by Sherris on vipers uh, had this interesting statement. The viper is by many taken for an image of malice and cruelty, but in reality, she is guilty of no such thing. And that was written in 1677 uh, by one of, the, uh, one of the first monographs on snake behavior. Uh, now, of course, a lot of reptiles, uh, including snakes and crocodiles, are dangerous, and they've been uh, also revered and protected and often worshipped. Uh, snakes are actually the most important or most prevalent animal in religion uh, throughout world history. Uh, so they're valued by many people, not for ecological or conservation reasons, but because of uh, what they are. But nonetheless, we are very ambivalent about them. And I would argue that our anthropocentric biases and the potential threat to uh, mammalian and thus human superiority, and there's a lingering attachment to this a view of a great chain of being with, of course, snakes and reptiles being way at the bottom of it uh, among the vertebrates. And that this is true even among many scientists, even animal behavior people who really do not think too much about uh, the attributes of reptiles. But snakes have, I think, an important role in mammalian, including human evolution and ecology. And I'm going to try to argue that their cognitive abilities also are involved and really need to be explored. Uh, this is just an early print from a, a magnificent uh, a set of volumes, natural history volumes, uh, by a fellow named Siba, uh, who was uh, one, one of the first to put uh, reptiles and other animals, but particularly snakes, in a natural context. And these influence much uh, artwork, including uh, the French uh, uh, designer Lalique, who did much jewelry and uh, and and artwork and sculptures involving snakes. But reptiles do have a bad rap in ethology, even to the current day. So uh, these are just some quotations. The vision of reptiles is unimportant, simplistic, peripheral, and expendable proto-animals remain strongly rooted in society. Kalman wrote, numerous behavioral phenomena indicate a high evolutionary level of the avian brain comparable or even superior to that of most mammals. Such key elements of visual acuity, color, stereoscopic vision, cognitive learning abilities, labor vocalizations, communication, imitation, advanced social behavior, nesting, nursing, prolonged family partnerships, migration, homing, calling formation. In reptiles, similar phenomena are absent or rather infrequent and less elaborate. Uh, these Last one is by some really prominent cognitive, comparative cognitive ethologists. Although reptile cognition should not be underestimated, nothing at the level and scope of bird cognition has been reported for this animal group so far. Let's forget about the fact that birds are reptiles too for the moment. Uh, part of this goes back to the discovery and the claims that dinosaurs uh, were really uh, much more advanced and uh, much more bird-like than um, were reptiles. And uh, this was one of the books that really got me sort of upset back, at the, back in the day, The Hot-Blooded Dinosaurs. Uh, and 
I'll not read this quotation, but the idea is that there was evidence for social behavior and herding and so on, uh, moving in groups among dinosaurs, uh, but there is nothing like that in, in reptiles, lizards. This was along with other comments about slow, dim, sprawling reptiles. People tried to see dinosaurs as more bird-like, even mammal-like, and they had to confront unsuccessfully the fact that uh, uh, dinosaurs actually have pretty small brains, and we'll see how that fits in in a minute. But along with the work that we were doing on reptile social behavior, uh, in the conference that uh, Melissa mentioned, I wrote uh, my paper for the volume that came out of that meeting, uh, and I had this talked about baby reptiles and newly hatched reptiles and how they did show quite a bit of uh, sophisticated behavior and that such evidence can start on inferences about a generalized reptilian level of social organization qualitatively inferior to that found in birds and mammals. That was very gentlemanly sounding, but by the end of that paper, I uh, did wrote some things that you could probably not write in a, a peer reviewed journal article today. Well, I said that studies of reptile behavior have been sadly neglected as compared to birds and mammals. Attempts to uplift our attitudes to dinosaurs are admirable, but to do so at the expense of extant reptile behavior is not only to cut off an important source of evidential support for social complexity in dinosaurs, but also to obligingly demonstrate ignorance, exaltation of ignorance, perhaps even bigotry, at best, we have been too hasty and uncritical in accepting the common wisdom. Although I can understand the shaping of discriminatory attitudes through generations of unconscious cultural and even genetic bias, sympathy and patronizing patience do not seem appropriate in the presence of well-publicized propaganda. Thus, we need to be on guard against science being uncritically accepted as supporting and encouraging our deeply held prejudices this paper is but a partial brief in behalf of a maligned and oppressed class. Um, class, of course, being the class reptilia. Now let's talk a little bit about reptile evolution. Uh, as you, uh, we have the dinosaurs and birds, uh, part of it. And these are the Lepidosaurus squamate reptiles of which snakes are a major component. Um, just recently, within the last months, in, two important papers came out. This one, for instance, uh, shows how the snake radiations actually began at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, when the dinosaurs extinction uh, arose, that is, and mammals and birds really took off, that is when snakes evolution flowered. And you can see then that uh, lots of snakes uh, evolution took place even within the last 20 million years when mammals and birds were hitting their stride. And what were these snakes eating? Lots of mammals, a lot of vertebrates, a lot of mammals, lots of birds. So somehow snakes were able to actually deal with this new dietary resource that presumably was so smart and advanced, but the snakes had a way of exploiting them. Now, when you start talking about snakes, one of the things is that uh, we have to realize that even compared to lizards of the same size, snakes have small brains. And there is this bias, of course, that bigger brains are better even though we know in our own human um, evolution, recent research is showing how our brains are actually shrinking even in the last few thousand years. But none of how, uh, Jerison wrote a, a book which he made the claim that uh, compared bird and uh, reptile brain size and found that for the equivalent size uh, reptile as compared to a bird, their brains were about 10 times smaller. Okay. And if you look at uh, a more updated list of reptile brain evolution, we see that uh, snakes are actually on the low end. And this is a log scale, so that you don't mind. But if you do updated brain measures, 
uh, as Enrique Font and his group have, have done, uh, we find that actually uh, take a turtle versus a bird, bird has been evolved to have a very light body. It has to fly. It's got feathers. A lot of reptiles have heavy bones and shells and things that weigh a lot, which may not necessarily uh, mean that they have to have a bigger brain for that increased body size. And so uh, if you look at the log volume as well as long brain mass, if you look at, uh, you see that Yes, there is a difference between bird and, and reptile brains, and snakes are going to be at the lower end of that, but it's not nearly as extreme as it was once thought. So I was interested in the learning abilities and cognitive processes of reptiles for a long time, and I was asked uh, by uh, Carl Gans, who was the editor of the Biology of Reptilia, to actually uh, do a chapter on reptile learning, which I uh, took as a serious task, wrote over 100 pages, trying to review all the literature, even though much of that literature was really pretty bad in terms of science. But nonetheless, I concluded that uh, the data review demonstrate that reptiles can learn tasks of considerable complexity, and there is no evidence of any absolute demarcation between reptile and bird or mammal in terms of cognitive abilities. Uh, that chapter came out, uh, didn't get a heck of a lot of attention because not that many people were actually interested in reptile cognition, but in the last 20 years, uh, that chapter that now is over 40 years old has actually been coming increasingly cited in as a response to the fact that there are more papers coming out on reptile cognition. I did a, a further review a few years ago, but actually there's a lot of literature coming out now. For instance, turtles, all these concepts and ideas have been shown in turtles and in lizards. But there's not that many studies on snakes, crocodilians, and the tuatara. Well, the tuatara uh, being a, a relic species that's endangered and uh, very hard to study. Crocodiles, of course, are large and not many laboratories can be devoted to uh, studying their behavior. Uh, but snakes, um, there's been some work, but not a heck of a lot. But as I look back at our lab's research, I find considerable evidence that snakes can be thoughtful and patient animals. This is just some uh, recent uh, reviews of reptile learning uh, that uh, I want to mention most recently, uh, there's a impress, uh, although I think online you can find it in behavior, a special issue on uh, reptile cognition. There's only one paper on snakes in there, and that is the one I'm going to talk about uh, later. We're also finding out that uh, among reptiles, there's a lot of personality and temperament differences that are really psychologically uh, uh, important. And that has to be taken into account if we keep reptiles, if we study reptiles and so on. In other words, there are uh, strong evidence for personality and individuality among reptiles, even animals born uh, from the same litter or clutch of eggs. So 95% of all reptiles are lizards and snakes but snakes have been far less studied than lizards. We do have some work on classical and operant conditioning, habituation, spatial learning, plasticity and feeding, anti-predator behavior. Uh, but I'm gonna focus on the several research projects, selecting some of them from my students and colleagues to show examples of the deliberateness and decision-making we find in snakes that may explain aspects of the success in dealing with these smart, birds and reptile uh, and mammals um, that may be very important in that success in addition to their well-known morphological and physiological adaptations. For instance, the jaws that can swallow a large prey and uh, the physiology that allows them to go long periods without eating and so on. But before we get into this, we need to deal with a couple of topics, one of which is 
issue of anthropomorphism. When we're starting to deal with an animal that is so alien to us in terms of our own psychology, or it seems that so it's alien, uh, to attribute it uh, characteristics that are, we consider sort of uh, advanced or cognitive may be a sin. And this is something that we were taught, many people are taught in their own behavior classes that uh, it's not good to attribute human characteristics to non-human entities. And that's a grievous sin. But uh, it is also a sin, in my opinion, to unwittingly neglect the animal's perspective and umwelt, which is an equally grievous sin. And I'm gonna come back to that in a, in, in a, in a moment. Critical anthropomorphisms are what I've proposed as a way of taking our own abilities and traits as a cognitive beings with our own emotions and thoughts and apply that along with all the scientific data we have about an animal's sensory abilities, its physiology, its ecology, its behavior, its sociality and development, and use those as a backdrop for doing good research. So it's, for instance, if you judge other species using anthropomorphic markers such as screams or facial expressions or speed of responding, this can be very uncritically anthropomorphic and a hallmark of anthropocentrism, that is viewing humans as the center of the uh, a psychological or behavioral universe. And this is especially problematic with reptiles, that we know they do not have facial expressions that we can read easily like those of a dog or a monkey. So Jesus Rivas, who uh, gave a previous uh, talk in this series, and one of my favorite students, uh, coined the term protelomorphism. How would the world be viewed through a rattlesnake? How would a rattlesnake view a human versus how we view rattlesnakes? And the idea was that we can use this, this is a quote from the paper, we can use critical anthropomorphism and trying to wear the animal shoes. We can overcome part of our natural bias and attain a more legitimate understanding of the life of other species. We encourage other researchers to put themselves in the position of their study animals, not only as a novel complementary approach to the work, but as a required step in conducting good science. That's a pretty strong claim. So I'll go back to some of my early work got me involved in, in snake research and thinking about the uvelt of snakes, uh, is that I discovered early on that baby snakes even though they've never eaten anything in their life, if you give them, a, present them with a cotton swab that's been rubbed, for instance, on an earthworm, and this is a garter snake, uh, they will approach that, tongue flick at it, and attack it, even though it doesn't look anything like a worm. So what is going on? Well, uh, we studied this a great deal, and we know that these animals are set at birth to identify prey items that would be very part, that would be part of their natural diet. And uh, there's heritability to those responses. There are developmental changes. Diets can change as the animals mature, uh, but we know that experience can have an effect too. And uh, so if you feed an animal one prey over another, it may develop a preference for that. But we went even further this just shows, by the way, the uh, vomeronasal nasal system, which is where the tongue brings in chemicals by, that identifies by flicking at objects, and they go into the mouth where there's a, the a vomeronasal nasal organ, and this proceeds to the accessory olfactory bulb. Okay, this is just a, a MRI of a of a of garter snake brain. Uh, different species of garter snakes, in this case, water snakes, uh, respond differently to to the same prey items. So a banded water snake uh, will respond to frog and minnow extracts, which are what it normally eats, but not to those from crayfish. On the other hand, two crayfish specializing snakes at birth. Queen snakes and Graham's water snakes, 
uh, respond to crayfish, and particularly they can discriminate hard shell crayfish from the soft shell crayfish that they prefer to eat over the hard shelled ones. And uh, now this all of these animals are not matrix anymore. They're Nerodia. This paper was done a long, long time ago. Um, and the two crayfish snakes have been moved to a different genus, Regina. But we can, we showed that one trial learning is very important. In back in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, there was uh, a Garcia and others found that animals could be conditioned to avoid food, even though it didn't just taste bad, but it made them sick. But they didn't become sick until a long time after they actually experienced the food. And this would be particularly a way of developing aversions to toxic items. And so what we came up with an experiment in which we took garter snakes and we had four animals here. These were adults now, not, not babies, um, but they were accustomed to feeding on fish. And they, that's what they were diet. And so you could tell when you gave them six different fish on one day, they responded to them within seconds, okay. And then we did them again four days later, they always responded. Then we gave uh, these animals earthworms which uh, was relatively novel to these particular animals, uh, but they also loved the earthworms and ate them very quickly. Then we either gave some animals, injected them with saline. Other animals rejected with lithium chloride, which uh, will make animals sick eventually. And right before we fed them the worms. And you could see that Four days later, when their next meal would come, they really avoided those earthworms. Those animals that were fed the saline had no uh, aversion to them. And uh, we went on and showed that that effect would last some time. I don't want to go into any more detail to show you, but just to show you that one trial learning, one bad experience with a food item, just as it can with humans, can make you off that food for a long time. Here's another example of anti-predator behavior. Everybody, well, many people are familiar with the hog-nosed snake, which uh, if you disturb it, you find one in the field, it'll start writhing around, as you can see here uh, in, the, in, the, in these uh, pictures, and eventually turn upside down, st stick out its tongue, and play dead. It stays that way for a while, it stops breathing, it may defecate, it may, blood may come out of its mouth, and then it starts to recover. The head may come up, the animal starts looking around and then moves off. This is a baby hognose snake that we studied. This is uh, just patched and uh, it also goes through that whole display and it uh, looks completely dead, it's not moving. It's not breathing. Its mouth is open in this case and has a tail in the mouth. But sometimes it'll also even, uh, blood may come out and it may defecate even though it has never eaten anything yet, but it still has uh, some yolk system of uh, uh, nutrition in its, uh, in its system. Well, Harry Green and I were interested in, well, is this animal really sort of unconscious and out to the world or is this a um, more complicated display. So we performed an experiment with newly hatched hognose snakes and we watched how quickly they would recover from their death feign in the context in which they uh, were being presented with no stimulus or a mounted owl, a screech owl that was close to them, maybe within uh, a meter uh, from, their, uh, from their head or I would look at them either staring directly at the snake with my eyes or having my head in that same position, but averting my eyes. So I was looking to the side, I wasn't gazing directly at them. 
And this was to determine if the snakes, although viewed as in an unconscious or a cataleptic state due to such intense fear that just made them pass out, were they actually monitoring their putative adversary and delaying their recovery. In fact, they were. So uh, this is the control time uh, that they normally would take to recover. If nobody, there was nothing in the presence. On the other hand, if the owl was there, it, it took them longer to recover. If they also took longer to recover when a human was uh, in their presence, and more so if the human was looking directly at them, or if the then if the human uh, was had its head in the same position but averting its eyes, so this seemed to indicate that the animals were in fact monitoring uh, the putative predator and responding accordingly. Here's another uh, interesting animal that I. Uh, spent a lot of time working with Im, a two-headed rat snake. Im, the name comes from uh, the idea that one head was instinct and the other head was mind, which is sort of this conflict between the mental uh, and the instinctive aspects of an animal's life. Uh, so the animal would eat sometimes uh, two mice, both heads would try to, try to eat. And in fact, we uh, spent a lot of time measuring every food item this animal had for five years. We weighed the, the, the prey and we looked at search time for each head, the handling time for the prey, the total time cost in, in foraging, the total weight of prey ingested, and the profitability, of how much grams per hour of, uh, of effort that they uh, find. And we found that it was virtually identical. And the snakes you could see would sometimes compete over the over the prey. Well, this didn't seem to make much much sense, right? I mean, if they have one stomach and the food's going there, why should they be so competitive? Uh, just more evidence that uh, snakes weren't too bright. But we found out uh, with a, a further analysis of Paul Andriotis uh, of this animal that it actually had two complete stomach and intestinal systems. So there was hunger from two stomachs, each one working on its own head. So was this uh, one snake or two snakes psychologically? There's another example of snakes, of luring. We know that uh, many reptiles uh, can use lures. They can use tail lures. Uh, this is alligator snapping turtle with its tongue that can be used as a lure. And there's one interesting uh, colubrid snake, a mangrove water snake. It's one of the few snakes in the US to inhabit a saltwater environment, the brackish water. It's limited to the, or it's linked to the red mangrove uh, found along the Atlantic Gulf Coast. And fishes are the only known component of their diet. They do not seem to eat anything else but fish. So look at this. This is a typical exploratory tongue flick seen in snakes as they're negotiating their environment. Now look at this one. A much longer and more interesting tongue flick. And those tongue flicks, uh, which uh, you'll find are, could be a lure, in fact, generally are much longer than a normal tongue flick. So the animal sticking its tongue out it's not just trying to pick up sensory cues the way a normal flick uh, seems to function, but it is doing something else. And this is what it may be doing. So 
So it's deploying this particular snake fishing lure. Now here's one that's much longer and the animal is retraining, refraining from attacking the prey too quickly. That time it wasn't too successful. These luring tongue flicks, uh, Carrie showed, uh, Carrie Hanscott showed, only occur when there are fish present. Okay, only when fish are present uh, do these lures appear. So we were interested in what are the stimulus cues that are affecting this luring? Are they visual cues? from the fish being around, or are they the chemical cues that the uh, uh, fish are emanating uh, from their bodies that the snakes, uh, we know snakes are really attuned to chemical cues. So taking the, uh, the Umwelt view of uh, looking at things from the snake's point of view, he developed this uh, the, uh, Aquarius situation uh, where we could film the snakes from overhead, <clears throat> And from the side, this is the snake's view of a video of little swimming fish. But of course, they were not in the water, uh, smelling, giving the chemical cues in the water or not. So what we did is we used this apparatus to test the snakes without the vision, visual cues, with just the swimming fish view, or with chemical cues in the water, but no fish, or the chemical and the visual cues together. And it was the chemical cues, the odor of the fish, <clears throat> as well as the visual cues that were most effective. But after experience, some of the snakes began to lure to visual cues alone. Again, an evidence of plasticity and learning in their behavior. Here's another strange story developed uh, with my colleague in Kyoto University, Akira Mori. <clears throat> uh, this is another nature scene snake related to uh, our water snakes and our garter snakes, uh, but it's in, from Asia. This is from Japan. Uh, but these nature scene snakes generally lay eggs rather than being live bears. But this species and some of its relatives have a very unusual anti-predator behavior, defensive behavior. This is a baby Rhabdophis in a lab right after birth or being born. And uh, if it's disturbed, it arches its neck in this distinctive way and basically holds it there, almost daring you to attack it at its most vulnerable area the neck, which is where many animals that are predators of snakes aim for. Well, we've, the thing is that there are some glands up there and those glands are poisonous. The snake also, by the way, has uh, venom. It's a rear fanged uh, a snake in a sense. It's got some uh, venom and it's venom can actually uh, and has killed uh, humans, but it does not fight uh, very often. Nonetheless, it has these nuchal glands, which when it's arched, it presses those glands or structures them so that an irritating liquid can be expelled at the slightest contact. And these glands uh, contain bufaconic toxins. And where do they get those toxins? By eating toads. And these are maternally provisioned. This is an example, you might say, of maternal care. So the uh, toads, um, if the mothers are eating toads or being fed toads, they develop the toxic glands, but they also pass on those toxins to the glands in their developing embryos and the, and, and the eggs. How this happens, we really do not know yet. But we do know that uh, if Rhabdophis are uh, from 
islands that don't have any toads, they just eat frogs, these are amphibian specialist uh, species, uh, they don't do the same behaviors at the same frequency. They do the typical snake thing, a garter snake thing, a water snake, a fleeing rather than staying put and going in through these defensive displays, which since they haven't been eating toads, uh, they're not going to be effective as a defense. But if you take these animals from the toad-free islands, the, the hatchlings, and feed them toads, all of a sudden they start to begin performing the toxin-related behaviors more frequently than others. So do these snakes know, can they learn how toxic they are from the diet that they are eating? Uh, another side bar here is that the mothers, uh, if given a choice, if, if you're a gravid snake, a gravid female, and you're given a choice between following trails and eating toads or eating uh, frogs, they will focus on eating toads. However, male snakes and non-gravid females uh, don't necessarily, they don't prefer to eat the toads. Only the pregnant females seem to really, the gravid females really focus on eating toads, which may be then a way of them profusioning their offspring with the defensive toxins that they could use for their own survival. So I'm gonna finish up with one example uh, of our latest work. Trying to make the case that maybe snakes have more in common with uh, primate behavior, our own behavior, than we may be willing to accept. And I'm gonna start by talking about this famous self-recognition test, the mirror mark test, that was developed by Gordon Gallup and his colleagues over 40 years ago. And it's considered sort of the gold standard in trying to determine which species are self-aware or self-conscious, view themselves as a separate entity from the, from the world. And the point of these studies is that if you take a chimp and you put a little spot on its face uh, that it can see in a mirror, and uh, it will try to remove that spot. But if it, you put a mark that it can't see, but you go through the same procedure, uh, the animal ignores it. Most animals, when they see a mirror image, they do not view it as seeing themselves, they view it as seeing another individual, and they may uh, display to it, they may try to attack it, they may do a variety of different things with it, uh, but they don't seem to recognize that, hey, this is, this is me. Of course, infants will, uh, human kids will develop this behavior, it may take them a few years to do that. Uh, there have been claims that, uh, Dolphins uh, can show this behavior, elephants. The problem is, of course, that when you start looking at other species, uh, you, you know, a dolphin doesn't pick at itself. So you have to come up with some imaginative ways of getting an equivalent type of mark test. Uh, recently, a paper has come out showing that horses can also um, may pass this test. Uh, Gallup and his colleagues uh, most recently, in this, for the last couple of years, have evaluated these articles, uh, all the research on the mark test, uh, the visual mark test, and claim that they all have flaws except their own work and uh, are those of people with apes, in other words, orangutans and chimps. And gorillas can pass the mark test, uh, but they think that there are fatal flaws in all the other experiments. Um, this is controversial because many of the people doing those experiments are not uh, necessarily accepting those critiques, but they're maybe going back and doing better studies. But the but my situation is, or what I'm interested in, is that this mere self-recognition, which is considered a gold standard uh, using that mark test, is biased towards visual animals. And snakes and other species um, are 
more focused on olfactory or chemical cues. And recently studies, uh, dogs have become very popular in animal behavior research, comparative cognition research. And there are some papers uh, listed here that have found that, uh, hey, we can find self-consciousness in dogs. The olfactory mirror test, smelling themselves. Uh, just this year, a paper came out. A gray wolf may show a sign of self-awareness with the sniff test of self-recognition. But what about snakes? There actually is literature out there that none of these people studying mammals have even bothered to look at. So there is some body of data out there arguing that there may be self-recognition of a chemical basis going on in reptiles, squamate reptiles. And the first really work on this, I uh, credit David Chazar, who discovered that when they took snakes out of a cage and uh, to clean the cage and then put the animal back in a spanking new cage uh, cleaned, uh, the animals would often immediately begin to move around that, defecate. And the argument was that this clean cage was stressful to the animal and one and one that smelt like it was used to. And uh, that this was a way of uh, making the environment more familiar to them, more comfortable to them. Uh, and so he did a number of experiments and even claimed back in 91 that a chemical sense of self in uh, timber and rattle and prairie rattlesnakes. Uh, he reviewed much of this work in a really nice chapter in the Health and Welfare Kept Reptiles book, uh, came out in 95. And other people did some similar types of things uh, with lizards and particularly Albert's uh, pheromonal self-recognition is I think a, uh, an overlooked uh, masterpiece. Generally, we find less tongue flicking exploration with their own stimuli and more to clean conspecific stimuli, but this pattern is variable. I love garter snakes. And uh, uh, there was a paper on garter snakes that was done a long time ago by uh, Zulema Tang Martinez now, uh, who showed that garter snakes showed more tongue flicking and movement to their own conspecific cage substrates than the clean ones with significantly greater responses to conspecific odors. But the problem with all of these studies, if you go into the details, is that uh, they didn't really eliminate a number of things. For instance, self from conspecific discrimination could be on the latter stimulus being novel, right? You habituate to your own odors, but you are maybe responsive, more responsive to those of, of others. Uh, the conspecific age, the animals that were used in the studies by Chazar and others were animals that they just sort of happened to have in the lab or came in as adults or had diets that varied a great deal. And uh, since chemical cues are involved, we know that animals recognize uh, feces and they can uh, recognize their own feces and those of conspecifics, uh, that's uh, certainly a, a factor. Genetic and sex differences can be involved. Uh, for instance, in the Zulema study, uh, she couldn't sex the snakes, so she couldn't determine if she was dealing with males or females or who was being tested against whom. So we went back to this phenomenon in this paper that uh, came out in this special issue on rec chemical rec reptile rec cognition in just this uh, uh, last month. And we're wondering, we're waiting to see if this is going to uh, convince anybody. But basically what we did is we took animals from the same litter. We had a, a, a litter of garter snakes from my cabin up in Tennessee. 
uh, our students found it and they said, hey, let's do an experiment uh, with, <laughs> let's keep this animal to give birth and do an experiment. So uh, I came up with, uh, with this idea. And uh, so we had these animals, we, we fed them in the laboratory on either fish or worms. Uh, we had 24 subjects that we used for the experiment. Uh, most of them were earthworm eaters and some were on all fish uh, a diet. And we housed them individually, so they really didn't have much uh, social interaction with each other, uh, but they did fine and uh, ate the foods. Then we collected the cage liners in which uh, the, they were living on and defecating on, uh, but not we had to, we change them every few days or every week at the most. And uh, then we put them in test environments and looked at their uh, response to these different cues. So they had their own chemical cues. In other words, uh, they were give, put on a substrate that they themselves had, uh, had used or ones from a litter mate, same sex litter mate, that was fed the same diet or one fed a different diet. And then we had the clean cage because of the control. And we videotaped these trials. A lot of the early studies uh, just had somebody sitting there with a notebook and uh, checking off if the animal responded this or that. And there are problems with that kind of research. I won't get into it now, but in terms of intra-observer reliability, the fact that you're not blind, uh, you're not blind to the stimuli that you're uh, testing, and uh, and you can't go through the sequential analysis of uh, do a sequential analysis of the animal's behavior because you're just checking it down at at that time. So we videotaped all our trials and we uh, coded them in a way that uh, student observers were not aware of who they were observing, what the stimuli uh, were that the animals were being tested with, and so on. And uh, we recorded the tongue flick frequency, how many times they were flicking their tongue, which is comparable, in my opinion, to sniffing in a mammal and the, uh, and their amount of movement. And I'm only going to talk about the tongue flick uh, data. Uh, but we also looked at the data, not just by the totals in the 30 minute period, but by 10 minute blocks. And I'm not going to go into all the details, except just to say that if you look at the last part of the data. If you see here, these are males and these are females, females on the top. And generally there's over the 10, 30 minutes, every 10 minute period, there's a decline. Okay, it's some habituation. But in the males, more than the females, you can see that there's a significant difference here between their own diet stimuli and the same sex, a male, another male from the same litter mate, genetically very similar, being fed the same diet. But they didn't, and this is also true between the different diet and the same diet animals. And this was, uh, there were other statistical, statistical differences that I won't go into, but this seemed to be a really uh, important one. And one of the reasons, well, why might that be? Well, we know that uh, from other studies that snakes can prefer to hang out with animals that eat a different diet than themselves as a way perhaps of reducing competition. So in this study, genetic relationships was a factor that was controlled. Sex was controlled, age and diet was controlled. And it does seem that snakes can discriminate their own chemical deposits, which would be like a mirror. So they are having a mirror recognition, we're claiming, uh, to that, hey, this is my chemicals. Maybe not as compared with this is my face as viewed in a mirror uh, versus somebody else's. And we only based the study on one litter. So obviously replication is needed, but it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, cannot be dismissed out of hand. And I think it's something that people studying mammals uh, need to take uh, seriously or critique it. 
Furthermore, the collected data across the snake studies may be as strong as those, certainly for the dog and wolf odor recognition papers. So the snake chemical recognition studies have been largely ignored as by the animal behavior community, as well as by herpetologists themselves, who had not picked up until recently on Chazar's challenge. So finally, I've hoped to show in this presentation that an ethological approach to the problems of anthropomorphism and thinking about how the animals we study experience their worlds, even ones apparently so alien us, to us as snakes, can lead to solid empirical findings that snakes are not reflexive automatons, but sentient decision-making animals whose amazing lives we need to respect. An important consequence of uh, documenting these kinds of uh, phenomena in, in snakes and reptiles in general is that we have to reevaluate then in which the way we maintain and study them in captivity, how we treat them. And uh, uh, this book that I mentioned that has Jazar's chapter in it uh, that came out in 95, Health and Welfare Captive Reptiles, an excellent uh, book, is now a second edition of that book is in press. So my final takeaways. Are we our own worst enemy and not seriously evaluating the cognitive complexity and social and sensory abilities of the species you profess to love and promote scientifically, that is snakes. It is not enough to do good studies, but we also need to integrate them into the larger theoretical and conceptual proposals that are being promulgated by mammal-centric and avian-centric gatekeepers in behavioral ecology, comparative psychology, and neuroscience. In other words, I'm calling for a revolution. So oh, thank you. I hope uh, I've helped convince you that uh, snakes are really interesting animals that are have minds of their own that we should try to understand. So I'll take any questions. Well, I'm convinced that they're interesting animals that deserve further study. <laughs> that was Awesome, Gordon. Should I stop um, the sharing? Should I stop sharing? Um, we can keep it up for a minute. I'm eventually going to have a slide to put up with a link to um to more information about the series and stuff. But I think right now we can keep it up. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This was great. Um, there are a couple questions that came in during the presentation, and there might be a few more that roll in now that we're on to the question times. Um, so the first one is from. Seal Klingler, hi Seal. And she wants to know if young garter snakes can learn to eat novel foods. And for instance, like in the West where we have these invasive crayfish in areas that previously had, had no crayfish and they would have only been feeding on something like frogs. Well, I think that's certainly uh, the case. For instance, uh, Rich King has been working on the uh, water snakes in Lake Erie. And uh, when some of these uh, invasive fish uh, uh, invaded the, uh, the Great Lakes, these snakes honed in on them immediately. And uh, their populations, I think, are in fact expanding <laughs> and kind of doing so well uh, uh, with these, uh, these fish, uh, I guess, pretty easy for them to catch and, uh, and predate upon. So uh, uh, that's within, of course, a same group of animals that they would normally be feeding on, on fish. Um, now, Hugh, Hugh Drummond and his students, a uh, former student of mine, but is in Mexico, has uh, been studying some of the garter snakes down there, including uh, Thanophis melanogaster. And uh, there's populations there that seem to specialize on crayfish, sort of like our uh, Regina I was talking about before, uh, but there seems to be isolated populations that have taken up uh, crayfish eating. And they published on that just a few years, uh, a few years ago. So I do think that uh, snakes can uh, uh, adapt to new, new, new prey. Certainly, uh, the uh, the brown tree snakes in Guam uh, decimating <laughs> the avian uh, fauna there uh, were eating things that weren't found in 
in the original habitat. And uh, certainly many of the invasive uh, species around the world, including in Florida, the pythons and so on are eating uh, prey that uh, uh, probably were not at all uh, part of their normal repertoire. Yeah, I, I think when I, I studied, Jeff and I worked on um, giant garter snakes, um, gigas in California in the Central Valley a few years ago. Actually, it's been more than a few years. Um, but there were a lot of introduced bullfrogs there, which can certainly cause problems for other garter snakes and other places where they've been introduced. Um, but the adult giant garter snakes, at least same thing, like they, they seem to feed on um, definitely the bullfrog tadpoles. And I think even some, some sizable bullfrogs, although probably not full size adults. Although I'm, I'm sure also that a fully grown bullfrog is definitely taking some small garter snakes too. So as it kind of works both ways, unfortunately. Sure. <laughs> um, so another question we have, um, and this is a, the username is, I'm probably gonna say this wrong, Synchrolinks. Um, why did you come up with the duality for the rat snake? You mean the name? Im? Let's see. Um, so there's, there's a bit of a delay. So if they're still on, it might take them a minute. Cause like, yeah, I was wondering, wondering that too. Um, I would assume the name, because that did seem okay. to be a very, a, a dual thing with one of the heads being, um, the instinct and one of them being the more thinking head. Well, that was just the, uh, the name I gave it when he first found the snake. The snake was found by a, uh, uh, a, a, a student uh, here at UT out in Oak Ridge. His father worked there at the Oak Ridge Labs, I guess. And if they found the snake, so there was always a idea, hey, the radiation, maybe. <laughs> but two-headed snakes are, uh, are fairly common. I have I have three of them uh, in little bottles on my desk right here. <laughs> uh, so they do uh, pop up uh, fairly, fairly frequently. Uh, but no one, no snake has been studied, I think, as long as ours or has lived almost 20 years. Uh, yeah, but wow. when we got the snake and I started dealing with seeing how it, you know, was conflicted over eating prey. And one of the heads uh, seemed to be more active in determining what direction they went to. Uh, huh. We had a little pegboard thing and the snake would go through and of course the, the heads would get hung up. <laughs> As they're trying to go through. And uh, so they have to learn how to, you know, maneuver. And one head sort of would take the lead. The right head was the one that sort of took more of a lead in locomotion. And then the food, I didn't mention that one. The left head ate more prey, but they were smaller prey or on average. And the right head ate fewer prey, but larger prey. But mm -hmm. over the five year period, this weight was virtually exactly the same. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but at the time that um, I came up with the name M, it was when there was this whole movement towards cognitive ethology to uh, trying to argue that uh, what we call instinct was really much more uh, complicated uh, mentalized. And so we're just trying to symbolize that conflict uh, between sort of the the cognitive and the instinctive, although I think that that's not a good dichotomy in general. But anyhow, M, at that point, we didn't even know what the sex of the animal was, but it was a he. <laughs> so we just gave it M. Makes sense. At least he had a name. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have some comments from people that work with captive and wild animals that they have also noticed that the snakes are much smarter and know what's going on than people give them credit for. This is something that we have certainly noticed in our work as well and agreed that there's certainly like lots of room for more research here. Um, and um, some compliments on the great lecture today and the series in general. And then let's see, another question. Um, do you know of any research on behaviors of pit vipers besides rattlesnakes? <laughs> um, I think in particular, they were interested in the mamushi, but um, was finding very little. And I, I do know that I can attest from looking at, well, it's, it's very rattlesnake biased um, 
just research on pit vipers in, in general of any sort is definitely rattlesnake bias. But um, I know that you've worked with some people that work with pit vipers where there are not rattlesnakes. So you probably do know a better answer to this question than me. Well, uh, yes, Barbara uh, Alan Savitsky uh, uh, did a dissertation uh, comparing uh, water snakes and uh, uh, and cottonmouths uh, moccasins from uh, Real Foot Lake in Tennessee. And uh, I had another, uh, Paul Andriotis, has spent lots of time uh, in swamps in West Tennessee at night tracking and filming uh, cottonmouths would come out at night and uh, has some amazing footage of them uh, striking a, like a cotton rat and then the rat jumps and goes to the water and swims around then comes out at another way and the snake patiently deliberately locating this and, and and finding it and so I think we have to realize snakes don't necessarily respond as except when they strike you know mammal type of way, but they have patience and they get the job done. And uh, we just have to sort of, again, put ourselves in the framework in which they, uh, they operate. Yeah, indeed. Um, trying to outpatient a snake, we always say when we're out in the field working with them, is just, you're gonna lose every time. They, they are the best at that. Um, so I think that about wraps it up for the the questions I saw, um, and we're a little over an hour at this point, so I think we'll start wrapping things up, but we'll continue monitoring the comments, and I'll make sure that Gordon sees any additional questions that come in once the live event is over, and yeah. Gordon, I want to thank you so much for doing this today. It was really interesting. I learned a lot. I think other people must have as well, and also thanks to everyone who tuned in and our supporters who make things like this possible. And then um, I'm going to <clears throat> do, uh, I'm gonna share some information. So if anyone wants to catch up with us after we're over, um, I put a link to um, Gordon's book, which I failed to mention in the introduction. The Social Behavior of Reptiles. Um, this is awesome. Kind of like a lot of the things that people are, oh, reptiles aren't capable of this and aren't capable of that. It's covered in this book. It's really, really good. Um, there's a link to where you can find out about that as well as some other interviews Gordon, Gordon has done um, on topics related to this. And yeah, I thanks again, everybody for tuning in. Snakes have a lot to teach us still. So I hope you'll join us next time on Snakes Are Everything. Take care and thank you for all you do for snakes every day. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.